radio show. All right, I talked to Kareem Manuel, and how did you get uh, hooked up with him? Yeah, yeah, um, a couple of years ago I met Kareem. Um, I actually met Kareem in Texas a couple of years ago. I met him probably about 13, let me go back. I met Kareem, I gotta really think about this. I've known Kareem for almost 10 years. When did we meet? I met Brian 10 years ago. Okay, 10 years ago I met Kareem. Um, they came down to visit Den, Texas, where I was living at the time. And um, him and Brian came by, and we just, I mean, we became really good friends because they were doing a real similar thing of engaging the urban context out in Chicago. So, yeah, that's when I met Kareem. Got you, and how have you, how did you disciple him over the years? Disciple Kareem? Yeah. Did he say I discipled him? I know, he mentioned you in did our he? interview. Wow. That's dope. No, no, I didn't realize that. Um, I, I mean, I would just say, the way that I feel like I've discipled um, Kareem or you know any guy from afar, I mean, just being intentional when we see each other. You know, I think that a lot of times people think discipleship is something that happens. You know, us in the Starbucks talking week in and week out. When really, in a lot of ways, you can get touches of discipleship from people who just care for you, and when they see you, they engage you right where you at with, with the appropriate word from God. So I think that in a lot of ways, my time with Kareem, or even what would feel like discipleship, is just consistent intentionality mm -hmm. and speaking love into his life. So yeah, that's what I would say. Got you. Um, have you communicated with Decipher and Cain? Have you discipled them at all? Aaron McCain? No, um, Eddie? Eddie? So probably not. No, probably or, not, no. Gotcha. And not decipher either? No. TJ? All right, cool. No. Then it was Kareem Manuel. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, so uh, what do you see in the potential of his music to reach the youth or the people of Chicago? Okay. Um, man, I think, so this interview is about Kareem's growth, maturity. It's the, part of it, yeah. Okay. No, I, I'm just, uh -huh. I got to get the context of what we're doing. Um, I mean, I think that there's a huge potential for um, a brother like Kareem because he understands, you know, a lot of the woes and the suffering of the people within the city. He lives in the city, does life in the city, um, is serving in the city in a lot of different capacities. And it is in a, a real critical role of manhood that a lot of us just don't have. And so I would say that because he serves as such a role model to a community, that when he writes music, that that music is a reflection of that leadership that's already being exercised outside of a microphone. And so I would say that I think that his music has a good opportunity to connect with people content wise, simply because he's just among the people. You know, when you're among the people, you can you can speak their language, you can speak to their pains, but then also you can begin to give practical solutions right for, for the things of where they at. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Gotcha. Sweet. Thank you. I'm um, shifting gears to what Dizzle was talking about yesterday. All right. So, Gosh. did you start the unashamed movement? No, Jesus did. So, what, let's go ahead. Yeah, what was he ahead. referring to? Gotcha. Then? Gotcha. Probably about in 2003, um, myself um, and another artist uh, were serving. I don't have to say, I have to say who that Lecrae. Artist? Okay, so 2003, myself and um, Lecrae were serving in a juvenile detention facility, and both were serving, we were both serving there, just out of a passion to reach the urban context. And he rapped, and I would preach. And we would do this week in and week out, and serve as the assistant chaplain in this facility. Well, as we began to connect, our hearts would just feel more and more to see them to grow to maturity. And so I was trying to figure out, man, how can we go deeper in discipleship? And Lecrae was really wrestling with, man, how can we give them music that's complementing the things that we're teaching them? And so he decided that um, he was going to do a couple of songs and a CD to put it together. Well, there's a guy named Ben Washer who intercepted it and said, man, there's a, there's a camp. They want you to do a couple of songs. Oh, by the way, why don't you do an album? Mm -hmm. um, and so what came of it was the real talk album um, that everybody got. Well, 
real talk was an expression of the faith and the life of not just myself and Lecrae, but men, a whole group of us who were walking with Jesus, who had came from the urban environment and now wanted to see Jesus experience with those people, but also with an expanding audience. So when people say that I was one of the first in the unashamed movement, really I was just around and living and walking with Jesus, but also cheering the efforts of those who were beginning to you know, create artistry and just the whole nine. So yeah, that, that's what he meant by saying, you know, I was the originator, I wasn't originator. Mm -hmm. It's just a whole group of us, and God blessed that effort to want to see that grow. Mm -hmm. And that camp was Kids Across America. Kids Across America. So Kids Across America was the camp um, that the, the music really began to take root in. Um, unknown to us, Kids Across America was reaching kids really across America. And they attached to it, they identified with the message. They identified with the, um, the packaging because it was very, um, what they would be getting on the radio in terms of production wise, but it was what they would get from a seminary in terms of content. And so Real Talk became kind of the, I don't know, it, it just came became the anthem for a lot of people. I mean, it surprisingly blew up for us, it, it really did. We were very shocked by what took place. We just knew that we wanted to see God honored in a growing up group of people that looked like us and, and had our shared experiences and stories. But honestly, I, I had no clue. None of us had a clue that, that all of this would take place. Mm -hmm. When people were chanting 116, that's mind blowing to me. It's literally mind blowing to me to think something that we have been living and fighting for in a little area in Roanoke and Denton, Texas, because we all came from major urban areas across the US, that we would see people across the globe with like these tattoos on their throat and on their wrist. Like it was a really surprising thing to see all that, so. Mm -hmm. What role did you play in the creation of Real Talk? Yeah, I mean, I, I did a couple of little ad-libs. I wasn't, I'm not a rapper, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of us grew up in an urban environment and either you're a ball player or you a you know, drug dealer or you're a rapper. And I was really neither or. So I, I played a little role, maybe some ad-libs or whatnot, but, but it really became obvious to me um, and to my brothers that I wasn't a rapper, even though you know, something in me kind of wanted to rap, but I didn't necessarily want to rap. So, no, I'm not a rapper at all. I'm more of a teacher. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I didn't know if with that role, you like, you looked over Lecrae's lyrics, helped him through like the writing and stuff, theology. No, no, absolutely. So what role did I play in terms of music and how that, the, I think if, if I did, if I played any type of role, it was just living out the faith with the brothers who were creating the artistry. And so in a lot of ways, man, we went on overseas mission trips. Um, we did a lot of outreaches with people. Uh, we were serving in small groups in a college setting. Uh, we were creating things for people to grow. And so I think if, if I played a role, any role in the movement of the unashamed, the role probably was just serving and living for Jesus and people being inspired by my faith. And so I would just say, if any role I played that role to influence lyrics, music, or whatnot, so, yeah, man. Gotcha. Did you get the first 116 tattoo? <laughs> the second. The second. The second. So, this, uh, well, this is, the, this is not the first. I don't want to show this on camera. This is not necessarily the first 116 tattoo. Um, the first tattoo came probably in 2003, and I was the second person ever to get a 116 tattoo. Uh -huh. ever and when I did it I did it because just unashamed you know we were already living and unashamed 116 was an expression was an outward expression of an inward reality and so when I got it I mean I wasn't thinking artistry I wasn't thinking you know thousands of people around the world would see this all I thought was man I'm unashamed and so I got my little first tattoo I'll probably get a cover up of it but I don't know it's kind of historic and so I may not get it covered up but yeah this is the second um, 116 tattoo that's probably ever got out so you know the the 116 anthem really became just an expression an outward expression of an inward reality is that meant we wanted to live for Jesus and we were unashamed about it and it just seemed to fit 
um, just the things that we were pursuing already. So, mm -hmm. how long were you with Reach? Like, what, for example, album? Like, what was your last album with Reach? Just to give me a timeline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, again, I'm not an artist. I'm not. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of people get that confused because I because a lot of the initial formation of Reach um, centered around the, our small group of you know collegiates who were loving Jesus from the urban context and wanted to see that spread back to the urban context but to an expanding audience because I was a part of the small group of that a lot of people believe that I did rap you know I served um, if you go back to some of the footage I may have been on stage as a hype man and you know just a contributing figure but I've never ever really been a music guy matter of fact there was probably about a uh, there was a time maybe six years ago, um, where it just became crystal clear to me and the brothers around me that my role was really a lot different. I was the one among the group of men that my role was not artistry, that I was a developer, I was a teacher, I was the person who was supposed to bring the best out of other people. Um, and that became very obvious to them and, and I just embraced it, honestly. Went to seminary, uh, went through a three-year development program so that I just wasn't flying by the seat of my pants. Mm -hmm. Pursued a lot of church planting, development, teaching. And so, yeah, I, I really embraced that role just as a man and as a leader because I realized that it, it was more than just, we needed more than just people who rapped and were on stage and communicating from a microphone, but people who were connecting and creating community. And also, I mean, from that, different nuances. We needed construction workers and doctors people who were living the unashamed life where they were living life at and not necessarily just people who were making records. Mm -hmm. So I would say birth out of all these things came just teaching and all nine. Yeah, I, I wasn't like, I didn't actually think you rapped. I was just curious like how long you were with Reach. Yeah, yeah. Until... oh okay, you said album wise. Yeah, just like in my mind, like how many albums uh, were you along okay. the ride for? Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I was, um, so in 2006, uh, we started Reach Life. Mm -hmm. And Reach Life was a, um, it was a complement to Reach Records. And Reach Life's goal was to create tools and resources to complement the efforts of churches and ministries so that people could actually grow in the urban context. Mm -hmm. It was a original part of the planning team of Reach Life. And so I came on as an outreach director. My job was to work with urban youth my job was to connect with urban pastors and begin to talk to them about what it looks like to create either effective ministry or to live and to learn about effective ministry. And so I did that from about 2000, 2006 to 2009. So we're doing, uh, I guess, disc history, what do they call it? The album history? What is it called when you have... Discography. Discography. What is it called? Discography, something like that. If, if we're looking at albums, the album um, that I was last around organizationally was probably Rebel mm -hmm. and from there um, in terms of work wise I left Reach and I began to work at Fellowship Memphis and served as a resident pastor for three years there mm -hmm. so I spent about three years serving with Reach Life Ministries and then from that three years um, Reach Life moved to Atlanta and I began to I served at a, at a three-year program at Fellowship Memphis Gosh, is that why you left the pastor job in Memphis? Is that why I left what? Reach life. Yeah, yeah, so, so basically, again, it just became more and more obvious that as a person, that my gift set really revolved around the development of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to do it in the capacity of a leader in a church. Um, and, and man, just the amazing opportunity that I had to reach life, it wasn't a church. And I sensed the need to serve at a church, but I knew I also needed to be trained. So I began to work at a church in order to gain the training that I needed. Mm -hmm. Feel free to correct me at any time during this next exchange. But like some people would su like have suggest or criticized reach in the past for like targeting youth groups, and you're talking about like urban outreach. Yeah. Could, can you talk about that? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that. Um, so some people have accused Reach Life of targeting youth group culture. What they don't realize is in the season of life that we began, we were youth. 
We could only respond to the needs of those who we readily understood. And so when you see an exchange with a youth group, a lot of us were early teens, or we were early 20s, late teens. Um, so now that you see a growing targeted audience, it's because we're no longer early 20s. A lot of us are 30 or older. We have children, we have wives, we have mortgages. We're experiencing things we've never experienced before. And we're transitioning to a lot more mature manhood. And so I think that's why you're even seeing a change in some of the music and the content, addressing things like marriage. When we started, many men were not married. They were single men going from church to church, city to city, and they didn't have any attachments. Now people have wives and kids um, and multiple attachments. So again, I, I think that's why you see the transition over the years is because now we could relate personally with the, experience in, the experiences of a growing, maturing adult, not necessarily just that of, that of a youth. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any association besides still being close friends with the people at Reach? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, again, um, you know, my formal, um, my formal position at Reach Life ended in 2009 um, in terms of serving and partnering. Uh, we periodically do things formally together. So this year I'll be at the Unashamed Conference. I'll be doing a workshop on Build a Better Us, the Marriage Track, uh, which I'm the director over right now. Um, and we'll just periodically do things. You know, we don't have any contractual agreements or whatnot, but we definitely have still a great camaraderie and friendships. I have a lot of guys' support. Um, and, and it literally, you know, still a part of my life. So, no, we don't have necessarily a growing formal partnership, but we do do things periodically, and we do have a really good friendship. Mm -hmm. And you met Lecrae at Denton Bible College? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I met Lecrae in 2001 at the University of North Texas. Um, he had previously been involved in a college ministry, um, had left for a couple of years to go to another college. I came to the University of North Texas, and we ended up running back into one another. And so from there, as we were serving in a similar college ministry, we just became friends. I mean, at the end of the day, we just became friends. And we recognized that we had a consistent passion to want to serve the context that we came from. And so that's really why we bonded on the idea of, man, we want to be a visible light to the people who look like us in an expanding way. And that's how we ended up at Juvenile Detention Center. We wanted to be serving and we didn't have an immediate context to give it to anywhere. We were in a suburban area mm. and we were urban individuals. And the only place that allowed us to express it was a juvenile detention center. And so honestly, Reach Records has its humble roots in a place that many people were right off today. Um, but God is gracious to start small and to create his will, you know, just via faithfulness. So no, that's, that's how we met though. Mm -hmm. And you met Ben Washer through him just finding you? No, absolutely. So myself and Lecrae began to serve at, um, we go, we doing this. I'm tripping. I'm like, we're really doing this. <laughs> so the relationship with me and Lecrae um, began just serving in college ministry in 2001. And um, as we were serving in college ministry together, again, a growing passion to serve the urban context in, a, in an expanding way. What took place is, man, we, we were presented with an opportunity to serve the urban context to some degree through a prison ministry uh, or juvenile detention facility. As we were serving there, um, the Den Bible Church would place young interns who were going through a nine-month program at that facility or different facilities. And because Ben Washer was doing that program, we all started serving together within a juvenile facility. Mm -hmm. and so I actually met Ben through the juvenile facility, and he was the one who encouraged Lecrae, hey man, you should make an album. Um, and and it, honestly, we just had really organic relationships. It wasn't strategic. Mm -hmm. we, had organ we had organic relationships that end up turning organized. So that's how I met Ben Washer. He didn't find me. <laughs> Yeah, um, like so how did Kids Across America come into play? Ben Washer was a counselor at Kids Across America for about four years. And every year at Kids Across America, in order to reach their youth, they always created music that would coincide with themes that they were doing. And so the year that year, Real Talk was, was written, 
the theme of the of the camp was crossover. Y'all might have heard it. Crossover. Mm -hmm. From, From death, death to life. life. What's the whole duck? So, that, was the first, that was the first Reach KA song. It was. It was the first Reach KA song. And so he wrote the thing for it. Now, I'll tell you what's funny, though. So we didn't know. We just were still faithful and serving, you know, in the urban um, juvenile facility. I preach, he rap. We just be together and we just be serving. Well, the song and the record had been made. All we knew was there was a record that had been made. Some people liked it, and we were still doing what we were doing. We hadn't changed anything. We went to visit the camp so Lecrae could perform the song for the first time. And we drive down this winding road up this mountain, you know, to this really remote area in Missouri. When we pull up, we see this big banner that says crossover. We both look at each other and say, what is this? We go to the cabins and we're walking around listening to the students. They're singing a song. And we're looking like, is this really happening? And I think for the first time we realized, oh, God's doing something. We, were, we had no clue. And then they begin to talk to us about this, the single selling and this album selling. And they said, it's kids across America who are buying this album. And, and it just blew us away. So again, I remember that moment and pulling into that camp. It just freaked us out because it was like, this is the song we recorded in this remote, you know, studio. And now all of a sudden, there's these hundreds of students that we can see, but there's thousands of people are like singing this same song in this album. So it really was very surreal. Mm -hmm. It was a very surreal moment for us. So, but we were celebrating. Honestly, the relationship with Cross Movement came about just from our lead pastor having a relationship with Ambassador. And because Ambassador was doing an internship at a church in Dallas, he had built a relationship with our lead pastor. And our lead pastor um, talked to him about Lecrae and what was happening with him. And they began to kind of build a mutual friendship, which later on led to cross movement, carrying an album and touring with them and you know different collaborations that took, took place. And so honestly, cross movement, um, prior to joining relationship with them, I mean, really they were like our big brothers. You know, they had put us on to solid theology with an urban expression. And it's something that we had never seen before. I'm not saying it didn't exist. I know there are people who have preceded cross movement and really paved the way for Christian hip hop or Christian or Christ being expressed through hip hop. But in a lot of ways, they became our big brothers. And so, you know, it was, these are now our kind of big brothers and we're kind of serving with them in this capacity artistry wise, but also in the background having, you know, relationship with certain individuals that made that even possible. So yeah, that, that's how that kind of came about was there was a background relationship and then it just made sense to do this um, for the season that they did it. And so yeah, I mean, that, that's how that, that relationship ended up coming about. Can you tell the story of how like all these other artists came and joined? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, right now there's what, Andy, KB, I mean, just, yeah, just triply, uh... The originals. Yeah. yeah. How did, so how, oh, how, how the did they... How did the originals link? Oh, we were all serving the Basically camp. the 116 compilation. Gotcha, gotcha. Because wasn't Lecrae show and Tadashi roommates at one point, too? Yeah, well, Lecrae and Tadashi were. Lecrae and Tadashi, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, um... How did all the original um, Reach artists come about? I mean, we were all serving the same college ministry. And so, again, it, it really, we make it more complicated than what it is. It's the people that surround us, the people that we know, it's the people that we trust. And so we were all serving, doing life together. We were in community together. And some people had just the skills to already do hip-hop and rap. And so Sho was definitely one of those brothers. He had been doing music prior to Reach. He was in music when he was serving in Alabama, had did a couple of little mixtapes or whatnot, to my knowledge. Tadashi had done music before in Houston um, and, and did a couple little features and whatnot. Um, Lecrae rap. 
And, and then we end up finding, um, connecting with Trip Lee, and who was a young dude, he had like an EP out, and I uh, met him at a show one day, and man, really, um, Lecrae and a couple of brothers just saw a lot of potential in him, and he ended up being signed. He was one of the people who hadn't come up in our original relationships, and yet the Lord was real gracious to give insight, to be like, now you got something. Yeah, you are you are a brother who who needs to be doing this in some type of serious capacity. So, the way the relationships came about was really organic, um, really a response to the work that was being done behind the scenes of just living for Jesus, and it ended up getting put out on a record with a design logo and just a whole nine. So, that's how the original One One Six Lecrae Triple E Tadashi and Show came about. Mm -hmm. And how old was Triple at that point? When we met Triple Triple was about 15 or 16 years old. Um, he still needed to undergo some coaching and some development in order for him to be an artist. Um, an artist with an expanding audience, of course. And so by the time he released, I think if you only knew, he was about 17 years old. So yeah, he was 17 by the time he released his first album which is a phenomenal album, so. Cool. Yeah. Man, I, I, I often feel like overwhelmed by it. Man, I, I look at it and I say, then there's no way the five, six, 20 of us 10, 13 years ago have the strength, willpower, giftedness to create the type of movement that we're seeing right now. You know, it's really humbling. I mean, I honestly, I honestly got to feel humble by it. And it's, it's overwhelming. Sometimes it can be overwhelming to think, oh, I, I know where all this started. And everybody doesn't know, and they don't have to know. And so what I see now, not just with Reach, um, many things that's happened with Lamp Mode, the growth that's taking place with Collision. I mean, there's so many is paving the way. I say, man, God has a plan for his people. God will use small fish and loaves, and he'll multiply it. And so, so I think the thing that I've learned from it is that faithfulness matters more than any type of, you know, work, strength, just being faithful to what God has given you. And you do not know how it will bless you, other people, or a growing movement of individuals. And so again, I think the way I look at it now is saying, man, faithfulness really means something. And if God has given me something, I just need to be faithful with that thing. The burden that I felt is a burden to see people mature. And, and not just mature via systems, but an authentic maturity that transforms everything they touch. One of the areas um, that, that are real near and dear to me is the area of marriage. And it's because I've had a personal experience of a real struggling marriage and no insight on what it meant to navigate that marriage to a place of health and maturity. I mean, for years at a time, just struggled to try to figure out, okay, now how do I be a healthy husband? And my wife struggling to figure out, now how do I become a healthy wife? All in the midst of being in a church, all in the midst of being in a community, all in the midst of doing ministry. And so what we began to do is, I began to see some consistent patterns. Um, one, isolation will kill your marriage. You know, I've been taught growing up that a couple needs to keep their marriage to themselves, not share and, you know, divulge information because people were messy and could bring harm to it. I didn't also realize that refusing to give information also protected you from wisdom, also kept you from health, also kept you from life. And so, we began to share, share our life, you know, just experimenting. And our marriage was radically transformed because God started using wisdom. We were no longer hiding behind the appearance of a smiling couple, but we were a couple who were being honest and we were getting the appropriate teaching, truth, health to our marriage. And so, we began to do this with other couples because we said, you know, this has got to be something universal, I guess. 
And so we began to meet with other couples just to see if it worked with them. Well, it did. And their marriage just started growing. And I started going to seminary and reading books. And I was like, oh my gosh, God, God sees the marriage like the church. I never knew that. I just thought marriage was another notch within the church, not recognizing that marriage is a mini church. It's a reflection of the grander covenant community. Covenant marriage sits within covenant community. So we began to meet with couples and it just began to expand. And so out of that, we were forced to create an organized organism called Build a Better Us. Build a Better Us is a network of churches or a network of married couples and engaged couples who support one another so that each couple can care for their own marriage. We needed to see a movement. We anticipated a movement growing. Since I've been a part of a movement, I understood movements could happen from small things. So we wanted to see this with a, with a focus group, but with an expanding um, group of people that we would reach. So we're a movement, we're a network. So we don't meet in, we're not just in one area, one town, one type of people, but there's different types of people there. Not only that, but we're couples that support one another. You know, the greatest help that comes, comes from community. That you have other people wrestling with you through blind spots and tensions in your life so that as a whole, we can become healthy. But at the end of the day, you can have all the network, all the strategy, all the community, but unless you, what we, do, we call, care for your own marriage, then you will not grow. And so the last thing is, we knew it has to be personalized. So we're a network of married couples who support one another so that each couple can care for their own marriage. I mean, it's just been a phenomenal experience just to see couples authentically grow and then spread that health to their families, their kids, um, to the neighborhoods, communities, to their churches. I mean, it's, it's been a mind-blowing experience to see all this health come out of authentic transformation. And so that's what Build a Better Us does. Um, I do, can I plug my, my conference? Yeah. Good. Uh, one of the ways that we connect with people um, so that it doesn't feel overwhelming and intrusive is we do a two-day marriage conference, man, where we come in, we create a romantic setting. Um, there's dim lights, there's dinner, and we come into a church and we legitimately, or church or organiz organization, we come into a church or an organization and we put on a conference. We do a two-day conference where we are connecting as couples, we're working through issues of marriage, and we're encouraging one another to move forward as, we're, as we've learned from the weekend in marriage. And so it's called Pursuing the Extraordinary. If you go to buildabetterus.com, then go to book a conference. Uh, we'll come to different areas. We've traveled to different places across the nation already um, so that couples can begin to get glimpses of the help that some of our small groups are even just experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's what we do. That's what I do.